Jesper. I guess I know most of you, so I can skip the introduction. Um, so one thing about this talk, so the same thing as inceptions are unmasked, so like if at any, at any point if something is not clear, uh, you have some more follow-up questions, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, and I will be happy to talk about it some more. Um, and this talk is about building caches into your applications. I think if you uh, work as a programmer, this is something you have done before, so I'm not going to talk about L1 or L2 or like all that low-level stuff. Um, so the thing I'm mostly talking about today is, uh, for example, you have some code that pulls something from the internet from some remote resource, and you don't want to duplicate these calls, or like you have some big computation that you don't want to duplicate. Um, I mean, there's many use cases, and my scientific estimates says that every application has one of these uh, sort of cache things hacked together uh, in around every 2,000 lines of code. Um, so why, why is that the case? Why do so many people just add their own sort of like custom map or custom sort of tree thing to their application? Um, well, it's sort of very hard to design, um, like for example, an LRU root cache uh, that really catches all use cases. They're usually very application specific. It needs to integrate with your logging stuff. It needs to integrate with your metrics. Um, there are very specific hacks that you may want to use for your own caches. For example, you know that these kind of things are not going to be updated, so you want to put these very specific things in. Um, and lastly, we all like to reinvent the wheel as programmers, so that's also a big, um, a big point. And so the library I'm going to talk uh, about mostly today is called PSQs, uh, which is a library that allows you to build your own caches. Um, but it's very, I would say it's more like a toolbox, sort of low-level library. It doesn't give you any pre-built caches. So the nice thing about using PSQs is you can still have all the fun of reinventing the wheel while still having some pretty good guarantees about speed and safety and, and those things. Um, so in the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk about PSQs and some like algorithms behind it, uh, like data structures behind it. Then in the second half of this talk, I'm going to talk about how you would use this library uh, to have a simple cache in your application. Um, so this is one example, for example, this is um, EKG, which is a monitor uh, package uh, available on Hackage, which allows you to show some sort of runtime statistics about your application. It has like a web interface. And you can also add your own uh, gauges or counters to it. So this is one example why you would, for example, want to implement your own cache uh, so that you can integrate with uh, your EPG metrics and see if something is going, going on. Um, so here we go. So we're going to talk about PSQs. So the data structure in PSQs is really just a finite map, so a dictionary or however you commonly call it. Um, and there's some sort of priority associated with, with every element. Um, there are two implementations, two main implementations in this library. Um, so one of them uses uh, like this simple implementation technique for priority search queues, uh, submitted around 20 years ago to ICFP. Um, and this uses a tournament tree, which we'll talk about. I think tournament trees are really cool, and you probably haven't seen them before. Um, so that'll be fun. And the other data structure uh, is a bit faster. It uses Patricia trees um, and a min heap property. Um, so Patricia is not named after the woman's name. It stands for Practical Algorithm to Retrieve Information Coded in Alphanumeric. Um, so Donald R. Morrison was not only a great computer scientist, but also a great fun artist. Um, and it was invented by two people at the, at the same time. So the PSQs package was put together uh, around five years ago uh, during Zoo Hack 2014. Um, the in initial ID came from Simon, uh, especially for the, the using Patricia trees. Uh, and then we worked on it during Zoo Hack and uh, ended up sort of polishing it a few weeks after. So I think it's a, it's been a very successful Zoo Hack project because not always these are. Uh, these hackathon projects rarely come to fruition <laughs> after uh, after some months. And um, yeah, I'm giving a talk about it now because I was looking through my projects folder, uh, sort of searching in what would be interesting to give a talk about. Um, so here we go, PSQs. 
Um, I've written this talk in Litra Haskell, so we need to have some imports first. Uh, also, one language extension, which I think is probably the first talk I ever gave that only uses one language extension. Um, so that's nice, and it's bank patterns, so it's fairly uncontroversial. Um, and we're going to do like a small teaser problem first. Um, so we're going to be implementing Dijkstra's algorithm written to find the shortest path uh, in between uh, two nodes in a graph. Um, and the reason I included it is because it gives like a very, um, it's a very cool use case uh, and it really shows off where the library shines, I think. Um, because I'm not sure if you're aware, but implementing Dijkstra in sort of a purely functional language is not super easy. Um, and usually if you see these sort of like very concise demo uh, implementations of Dijkstra, they suffer from some problems. So for example, they don't really work on infinite graphs. Um, they need to, yeah, they go through all vertices initially. Uh, they need to do some, in, so if you implement Dijkstra, you do, usually you don't really want uh, only the smallest distance to the, to the destination, but you also actually want the path so that you can trace it. So that's also something these um, sample implementations often don't do. Uh, often they use values like max bound, uh, literally, or they, they are not really polymorphic. Um, so let's try to implement one of these Dijkstra implementations, which fixes all these problems in only one slide. Um, and this turns out to work, but only if I put the types on a separate slide. So uh, <laughs> as you can see, it's, it, it is actually very polymorphic. We have just have two functions. Uh, we have a discover function, um, which adds a new uh, node to the graph if we did, to the queue if we discover it. Uh, so with the distance and the path, um, and you can see there the only constraints I have is that my vertices are comparable and my distances are comparable. And then the Dijkstra function in its own also has very few constraints. Uh, the only additional constraint is that we can add two distances together. Uh, so we have a monoid there and we can take the zero distance. Uh, and then the graph itself doesn't even have a, a type for it. We just have, okay, you give me a vertex and I'll give you back uh, its neighbor and the distances to the neighbor give the starting vertex and then you get the result back. Um, so this is very nice and this works through the PSQs library. The first function, discover, uses the alter function. And this is really um, where you need the priority search queues. Uh, this is something you can't do with like a normal map or like a normal dictionary. I'll, I'll get into that more late, later. Um, because really the point is that you're able to take like a specific key and then change the priority uh, in a pure way. Um, so what this function does is you just give it uh, a new path you discover and if the distance is smaller than was, uh, what was already there, it will put it in the queue and otherwise it will do nothing. Um, so yeah, alter is a higher order function here. That is one thing. And um, then the sort of the whole of the Dijkstra is also not too hard, so you start out uh, looping with like an empty map. So the map is where you put the distances and you have the queue which also starts empty. Um, and then you just loop by popping something of the queue. If the queue is empty, we take the distance accumulator. If there's more uh, things you need to compare, um, then you will uh, insert it into the distances. You haven't seen this node before. Uh, and you will look at all of its neighbors. You will call discover for the neighbors because you might discover shorter paths uh, to nodes you already knew about. Um, and there's some filter in here so that you don't get the nodes twice. So there we have it, Dijkstra in like a purely functional way on a, on a single slide. Um, and so the question is of course, how does this relate uh, to caches? Um, and it does relate to caches because there's this sort of um, need to store some data under a key. And you can, of course, insert this data. You can retrieve it again. Uh, you can do that using data <coughs> for now. Um, but then there's also this need to pop something from, the, from this map or data structure you have uh, in a very um, small time. And it can be the oldest type and the smallest, the prettiest. Uh, Haskell is polymorphic, so we just have some key and we require that, it's or that it has an ordering. Um, and then the tricky bit is we also need to be able to do just the P for some key, key, uh, some key 
And so if you think about, for example, data.map, um, you can't basically can't do it using data.map because if you have the uh, if you have the key you can get the element out, but there's no priority, so you would need to have another sort of double ended queue, but then um, because Haskell is immutable, you can't sort of like suddenly go into the map and start changing things. Um, so in a mutable world, people usually like use a combination of a hash map or like some other map and then a, a priority queue, but in Haskell, unfortunately, we cannot do this uh, unless we really want to go messing around with IREFs, but we're, we're not going to do that for now. Um, so that's the main idea behind the PSQs library, that you have this map and then additionally some uh, priority associated with it. Um, everyone with me so far? Okay. Um, so we're gonna look first at the one implementation of how, how you may do this. Um, and that's called tournament trees. So this has been uh, invented in <coughs> 2001. Um, and the, the idea is fairly simple. So you start from uh, like a simple binary search tree, which um, I think most people are familiar with. And then we're gonna turn this into, into a tournament. Um, so I've given this talk before, and the first time I gave this talk was in the US, and I wasn't sure if everyone was familiar with, with soccer there. Um, so I used something that's universally relatable at Pokemon. Um, so here we go. <laughs> um, so as you can see, this sort of, um, we have a binary search tree. Um, so if you look at the lowest level, uh, everything is ordered alphabetically by name. So if you're looking for something, you can look it up really fast. Um, so that's one thing uh, we need. And then there's this concept of a tournament. So whichever Pokemon has a higher level proceeds upwards. Um, and this will allow us to uh, sort of pop the, the Pokemon with the highest level uh, really fast. Of course, there are currently some, some problems with this uh, representation. This is very naive. Um, but this is sort of like the, basic, the basics we start from. Um, so once we have Oh, you might wonder what the split key is. Um, so if you're doing a binary search tree, it's uh, necessary to sort of keep the highest key in every uh, subtree so you can decide where to search. Um, so for example, if you start at the top and you're searching um, for, uh, say for example, some of the Pokemon that search with the Z, you can immediately uh, know that it's not in there. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, okay. So. We have our binary search tree. What are the issues with that? Um, I mean, of course, one problem is that Bulbasaur appears on every level. This is going to take uh, too much memory. Um, and in general, if you think about having a tournament, um, if you immediately lose, you, it's okay. You only appear on one level. But sort of for every time you proceed uh, in the tournament, you appear in one extra level of the tree. Um, and appearing another time is problematic. Um, and if you look at the entire tree and you imagine that it has n levels, that means you can really appear on n minus one levels uh, if you do well in a tournament. Um, but, and this is the, sort of the key observation about tournament trees, um, every Pokemon except the winner, so if we don't count the winner for now, every Pokemon loses exactly once. So everyone gets knocked out of the tournament at some point because there only can be one winner. Um, so that is sort of the key insight about tournament trees, that um, we can sort of make this data structure more efficient um, by talking about the losers and all the winners. Um, so here is our tree again. So now I'm, I've highlighted the losers of every match here. Um, so we can build a new tree where only the loser appears. So we get this. So one thing we will need to take into account is where the, the loser came from, which side tournament they came from. So we sort of remember that Lapras really came from this side, and Snorlax came from this side. Uh, that's something we're going to need later on. Um, then another small edit we make is that um, the winner is a bit special, so we sort of put them in a separate thing. So I've only put it like a, like a dotted arrow there. Um, is it clear so far? So, one problem. If I remember correctly, it's also 10 uh, 
called to winners and losers piece. Right? Or, <clears throat> so I've, I, I think I've matched names of winners tree and losers tree. Yes. That's essentially it, right? Yeah. So um, we're gonna yeah that we're gonna talk about losers tree in, in a minute. Yeah. Um, so so one problem with this representation is so before in our nice um, big tree we had we had the property that if you have a higher higher level you're always on top of Pokemon with a lower level which makes it easy to pop the thing with the highest, uh, the highest level. Um, but this is not, no longer the case here. Um, if we look at an example where that's not the case, um, I guess it's, so for example, we have Cubone here, which is level 90, um, but Cubone lost against Bulbasaur, so you never got the chance to play against Lepros, right? Um, so the, we have an updated property uh, which is that if you are on some level, you are either the you either have the highest level of the left subtree or the right subtree, and we also store that right. Remember the red or so we remember uh, which tournament uh, you originated from. Um, another property is we still have the valid binary search tree, so we can still look up a Pokemon by name and change its priority or do whatever. Um, and there's two no no two notes with the same key. Um, and we still have this split to these properties that are more or less straightforward, except for the first one. Um, okay, so why do we need to remember where a Pokemon originated from? Well, let's look at the, at the Haskell implementation now. Um, so we have a simple data type for an element uh, in the tree. We have, um, so we're gonna use this throughout the talk. We always have like a key, a priority, and a value. Uh, I'm sure there's some space on Hackage for uh, a package that only talks about Pokemon, but in our case, we want to be a bit more polymorphic. So in addition to the element type, we then have our PSQ, which is either empty or there is some winner. Uh, remember, as I said before, we sort of store the winner separately. Um, and then inside the winner, we have this loser tree uh, data structure I identify happily with. So here we have the, the loser tree. Um, it's not too surprising. There's uh, two constructors, so it can be empty, of course, and there's two constructors, uh, left loser and right loser, um, which sort of does the tracking of where the tournament originated from. Um, so we can tell how, how things originated. Um, and then, yeah, there's a size. We have, we have uh, the element that's on that level, and the left and the right subtree, and the and a split key. Uh, nothing too surprising here. Um, and the interesting bit is that if we want to implement sort of what we traditionally see as the, the hard implementation of um, priority search queues or priority queues, popping the minimal element um, is actually really easy because we store the winner separately. It's sort of like floating on top. So taking the smallest element um, actually has like a very simple amount of implementation. And the hard implementation is really finding the second best uh, Pokemon in the tree. Um, so, yeah, as I said, uh, finding the like the second best Pokemon is the hard part. Um, and we know that the because we have this, uh, we don't have this heap property um, that you always uh, dominate your left and right subtree. Um, because of that, the, the Pokemon um, that is the second best could really be at any depth in the tree. It could be, for example, that the second best Pokemon started off playing the first match against the eventual winner. Um, so it's really way at the bottom of the tree. So do we have to look everywhere? Uh, not really. I mean, there's the, the other key inside that is the second best uh, Pokemon in the tournament. Um, they must have lost against the winner because otherwise they wouldn't be the second best, right? Um, so this is the second key inside. Um, so what we need to do is we don't really need to check, even though it could be at any depth, we just need to check the path uh, among which the champion originated. Um, and that's why we, we were tracking all of this stuff. Um, and so the implementation of finding the, the second best, once we know that, is also not too hard. We just need to check which constructor we have so whether the loser originates from the left or the right subtree, and then 
we sort of look for the for the second best Pokemon. Um, and then once this second best Pokemon is removed from the tree, along the path uh, at which we find it, we sort of need to replay the tournament. Um, this is some more code from the from the library um, in which we play the two. Uh, so we sort of pick the second best, and then we sort of play the tournament again amongst this path, uh, and then we end up with a new PSQ. Um, and one interesting bit about this um, tournament tree is it actually doesn't really depend on how you want to balance things. Um, so I haven't talked about this at all for now, um, but there's also some balancing involved in these tournament trees, like you want to be able to make sure it isn't completely skewed towards one side. Uh, you want to make sure it's more or less balanced. Um, and you can actually use any balancing scheme you want. It's completely separate from the tournament tree concern, so that's quite nice. And um, we use the weight balance trees in uh, PSQs, which is the same that uh, data.set uses, if I'm correct. Um, so that was the first data structure. Um, so it's time to look at the second one, which is um, a bit gnarlier, I think, but also faster. So the, the issue really is, so I think the, the tournament tree is a bit like data.map in this regard. Um, it's a fast data structure, and asymptotically, you can't really get much faster than it. Um, but there's also int map and hash map, uh, if you do Haskell programming treatment, which we all know are a bit faster. Um, and so I think this sort of int PSQ is to port PSQ, uh, what data.int map is to hash map, to uh, data.map. Uh, so we, we, we will fix the key type to integer, um, and this will allow us to do, do like a, a much more efficient implementation, even though it's asymptotically more or less the same. Um, and the first thing we need to do is convert uh, the names of our Pokemon to numbers, um, because we're fixing uh, the, the key type to int. Um, and I've just taken some random numbers here because I don't know all the Pokemon Pokédex numbers by heart. Uh, I'm sure some of you do. Um, so that's the first step we do. And then this is what the actual data type uh, looks like. Um, and I said, as I said, the details are a bit gnarly. There's a lot of sort of bit fiddling uh, going on in this, uh, in this model. So I'm mostly going to explain things in like a visual way again. Um, and the idea of a Patricia tree is fairly simple. Um, we have the, the number of a Pokemon, um, sort of in a binary encoding. And the, the basic idea is really that this number just gives us the path in the tree that we need to follow, right? So if we're looking for Pokemon 0001, uh, then we just start at the top of the tree, we sort of take path 0, we take path 0, we take path 0, and we take part 1. And, um, we're there. Um, so that's pretty simple. Um, of course, this is not really efficient. If we have a 32 bits integer, uh, we're going to need a bigger whiteboard. So um, the first thing we can do is just dropping the empty parts of the tree. There are always huge parts of the tree that are empty. Um, so we're going to start uh, by avoid, avoiding to create these. Uh, so it's already a bit more memory efficient, um, but it's not really very fast uh, yet. And one issue at this point, um, if you start at the top of the tree, you're always going to take the zero path, because there's no Pokemon that, has, that starts with a, with a one. Then if you're, for, if you're at this point, for example, you're also always going to take the zero part. Um, because there is no uh, Pokemon that has a one in that position of its of its number, um, so this is the second optimization uh, we can make uh, to arrive at the Patricia tree. Um, so rather than uh, drawing the whole tree, we're going to shorten the path, and at every node we're now going to keep what we call a mask, and this mask sort of tells us, okay, you need to look at this bit right here. And then, depending on its value, you go left or right. Um, and a property is that the masks, so the x in the masks, always move from the left to the right as well. Um, so it's still the same tree, only 
paths that have been shortened. Uh, and as you can see, the sort of the, the way we need to traverse is much short, shorter, uh, which makes a big difference because we often have like 64 bits or 32 uh, bits of keys. Um, and this is really what a normal attrition tree is. Um, so at this po point, we haven't really talked about like the priority search queue stuff at all. Um, so we're <coughs> going to introduce it now. Um, but yeah, I think the proficient tree ID is clear. Um, so we're going to do some tournament kind of thing as well. Um, and the normal Patricia tree, uh, the Pokemon are always on the, on the lowest level. Uh, the, you always have to defer all the way down. Um, so and this is really Simon Meyer's big idea, because I, I think he came up with this, um, is what, how can we sort of combine this Patricia tree uh, with uh, a minimum heap. And so the first thing we'll need to do is we'll need to take the Pokemon that have a higher level and put them on top again. Um, so again, rather than just having the mask there and the <coughs> subtrees, we'll extend this by actually having Pokemon in the leaves as well. Um, and that's really all we need to do. Um, so again, so normal Patricia doesn't in sort of the intermediate nodes doesn't really have anything except for a mask, and we've sort of extended it by moving the elements upwards uh, according to their priority. So the element with the highest priority is always at the top. Uh, and then the, this makes the code a bit different uh, from normal Patricia trees. So this is some extracts from the code we have. So usually your uh, for example, searching for a specific key in the tree, uh, and you're sort of going down the tree. If you end up with an empty tree, you return nothing. Uh, if there's a tip, which means like a singleton tree, you compare the key with what you, the key you're looking for. Uh, and then if you have a sort of an intermediate node that has, that has two children, uh, you're gonna check if the masks uh, turn out okay, otherwise you go back up. Um, and so the special case is that now we need to look, um, as we're sort of searching for an element, we need to look at every intermediate key as well, if this matches what we're looking for. Um, so you wouldn't have this case for a normal Patricia tree in the lookup, and otherwise we go left or right, depending on how our like, bit twiddling goes with the mask. Um, so that's it. Um, then some more code, uh, we can look at the minimum element of the, of the priority search queue. Uh, so in that case, we need to sort of look if there's anything. And uh, again, as I said before, the element with the highest priority is always just on top. So we can just return that. Uh, and then we end up merging the two subtrees uh, if we have any. Um, I'm not gonna go into merging because it's somewhat complicated, but also um, since we did the visual input, uh, the visual style explanation sort of more or less, I hope you're more or less able to see how it works. Um, so what are the properties of this tree? Um, well, we could either sh sort of go through them in English, but we can also just show the code because the properties are simply encoded as a, as a quick check test. Um, so we can't have nodes in weird places, you can't have duplicate trees. Then we check the uh, properties on the masks, so for example that they go from left to right and then they always match what's in there. And it also needs to have the many heat properties so that every Pokemon uh, dominates the Pokemon below it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, testing, uh, because testing these, um, these sort of data structures is not um, not super easy. Um, usually we want to quick check these things with uh, arbitrary instances, but in PSQ, right? Because we would have to, s if we want to generate an arbitrary instance, we need to make sure, okay, the mask is set right, the mask goes from left to right, it matches the binary values in these nodes. So you end up writing this really complicated arbitrary instance uh, that always generates a valid entry. Um, but then how can you test that you always have these, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem basically. You either write an arbitrary instance that already has all the right properties, um, but then you can't really check that the, sort of the methods on it preserve these nicely, right? 
So instead, we typically use another approach. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort of model our API as a, as a subtype. So we're just going to look at all the things we can do with this queue. Uh, we can insert something. We can delete a random member. We can delete the minimum. Uh, in practice, we'll have like a few more constructors here. And this, uh, we can write an arbitrary instance for this type so more easily. Uh, namely, we just generate one of the constructors with some random elements. Um, another thing I'm doing, uh, yeah, you can't see it here, um, but for one thing like I would do is rather than using an int for the key, for example, I would use like a really small int that only has like 10 possible values in its arbitrary instance because that way you can create like more collisions uh, and things like that. Um, okay, so we write an arbitrary <coughs> instance for that. And once we have that, we can write this code, which is also more or less straightforward to reapply an action to a PSQ. Uh, so in that case, we simply look, okay, if we, if we have an insert action, we do an insert. If we have a delete random member, we'll pick a random member and delete it, uh, and so on. Um, so once we have these two things, um, we can write a nice arbitrary instance um, because we just choose a number of random actions uh, and then we replay all of them um, and then we end up with a, PA, with a parity search queue and we don't really know if, it's, if sort of all the invariants are going to be correct uh, because maybe we messed up the implementation of our insert or the implementation of our of minimum. Um, and in this case, in that case, our test will point it out for us. Um, so that's usually how how we test these sort of things. Um, so I hope that's useful. Yeah, I, no, I think what you you mentioned that um, I'm working on um, kind of immutable vectors, also yeah. tree structure, and I think you suggested exactly yeah. this approach. I implemented it, and it did indeed find some more corner yeah. basis in terms of interaction between different operations. Okay, that's, that's cool. super cool. Yeah. Um, so how fast is NPSQ? And this actually relates to your thing. Um, it's pretty fast. Um, I have some benchmarks at the end of the talk. Um, there is also a straightforward way to make this even much faster, which would be to increase the branching factor of, the, of this tree. Uh, so you basically would have maybe four elements at every, uh, at every node. Um, but it's very hard to write this because there are so many cases to to yeah to go through and like every code has to every sort of uh, function has to do so many checks so I think nobody has gotten around to it in like five years um, so maybe it's a future uh, Zuriac project but it is already pretty fast because oh, I guess it's, it's kind of small it's a screenshot from the GEC track um, so there used to be uh, something that resembled the ORT PSQ in GEC to manage uh, timeouts for different threads. Uh, GC is runtime system and green threads that you may know. Um, and so it was replaced by the implementation we had from NPSQ. I mean, of course, it was just copied in because we don't want GC to have any dependencies. Uh, and it turns out that for some cases, it's around three times, it makes it things three times faster uh, just by changing the implementation of the queue. Um, so that's something I'm pretty proud of. Um, so, one last remaining thing. Um, the problem with int PSQ, of course, is that we fix this this key, this key type to int, um, so it's not super generally useful. Um, so how can we solve that? Well, um, we can create a new, um, another, so like a third uh, parity search queue, uh, and we can almost fit it in on one slide. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to simply hash the keys that we have, uh, and this turns them into an integer and allows us to have like straightforward implementation. So basically our uh, hash PSQ simply is an int PSQ. So that rather than having, uh, having elements, it has a bucket in each thing. And then the bucket is simply, uh, so we could do a bucket by having an, an ORT PSQ everywhere. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to have an ORT PSQ and then an additional member. So our hope is that in most cases the bucket will be a singleton thing and in that case the element will be immediately here so that makes things a little bit faster 
Um, but that's basically all I need to say about hash yes, security. So going back to your <coughs> idea of increasing the banking factor, could we borrow some ideas from like HAMPs yeah. or you know on hash map yeah, from from our um, I think so, yeah. But um, that kind of starts to, to look a bit similar. Yeah. Yeah, I think there, there's cool things we can we can still try there. Um, but the I mean the obvious advantage of this thing is that it's super simple and it's also fast. So uh, we haven't really I mean like we've spent a lot of time of time optimizing int PSQ, but we haven't really spent a lot of time optimizing hash PSQ basically. It's easier to have the bucket than either. So that in case you have something in the like if there are multiple elements it would be just easier to you know, work with because you have all the stuff to yeah. compare with these um, separate key or something. You can have an either, but the problem is then um, so this this or PSQ can also be empty, right? Yeah, but so it becomes empty if you if you do. Yeah, but then yeah. you have um, I, I think it's the same. Um, but then the if you have an either then you can have a left left for example, with yeah. a queue, but a queue that's empty. And in that case, you would have an invalid uh, state. Okay, yeah, right. Um, and the, another problem with either is that, well, you have this branch, this extra branch that you need to check. Um, and by putting it directly here, yeah. uh, it's sort of one less indirection. Uh, I'm not sure if it, if it matters too much. I think either would have also been like a valid implementation. Um, okay. Um, so this was the first part of the talk about like the data structure in hash PSQ, and we're now going to use these to implement a few caches. Unless there are some questions still about the first part. All good. Okay. Um, let's continue. Um, so the first thing we're going to build is a very simple pure cache. So we're not going to be able uh, to do I/O yet. Um, but we're just going to use uh, a cache that's an LRU cache. <coughs> so the ID there is okay, we, we're going to, for example, make calls to AWS to describe stuff and so on. And we only want to keep uh, the, the, say, the least, uh, like the most recent 100 calls in memory because otherwise we might be using too much memory. Um, so we're going to fix this number. Uh, another um, cool thing would be to sort of look at actually the byte size or the memory uh, that you're using, but for this talk I'm going to keep things a bit simple. And in, in order to determine like the, the path, so the most recent, uh, we're going to use simple uh, logical timestamps, so just like an in, in int 64 rather than using actual UPC time. Um, and we just increment this by one every time we do something. Um, so this is what our data type would look like. We have a pure cache. Uh, we have a capacity, which is like the maximum size that we will uh, allocate for it. We have the actual size. Then we have a tick, which is our time that just goes up by one uh, every time we do something. And then finally, we have the queue. Um, so as you can see, we had KPV before. Now the P is gone because we fixed the priority to this 64-bit uh, integer. Um, and one invariant that we have, so all the priorities in the queues are going to be smaller than the next, than tick, because tick is sort of the, the next time we're gonna, we're gonna go to. So all the values in the queue should be smaller than that. Um, and um, so, well, one easy thing we can do is creating an empty uh, pure cache. In that case, we just need to pass in the capacity uh, and then we fill in the capacity, the size, and the tick start at zero, and we have an empty queue. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll first define a function that trims it. Then we can use that uh, to implement lookup and insert. Uh, that makes it a bit easier. So this trim function is just going to look at the number of elements in the queue, uh, and if there's too many, so more than capacity, then we'll decrease it. Um, one special edge case that we sort of need to take to account is if we have these 64-bit running integers, it's, it's actually possible for these things uh, to reach uh, loop runs or max bound. Um, so we need to be a bit careful with overflow there. Um, one thing we could do if we reach uh, CPC tick uh, to max bound is we could just empty the cache. Um, 
these sort of choices are often kind of application specific, like sometimes it's not too bad if some calls are duplicated and you would rather have an easy implementation, sometimes um, you want to make sure things are correct. So when I was preparing this, I first want to skip it, but it turns out that it's actually uh, not that hard to do this correctly, so yay Haskell. Um, what do we do if, the, if we reach the maximum of the, the logical time? Well, we just want to look at the, we want to look at our queue, we want to look at the minimum priority, uh, which is hopefully something very high, and we want to look at the maximum priority. And then we just want to sub subtract uh, the minimum priority for everything, uh, so that we basically just reset everything to, to, z to zero again. Um, determining these <coughs> things is not so, well, determining the minimum priority is easy. We just look at the minimum element, um, and uh, these queues are made to, to find the minimum element easily, so that's uh, straightforward. The min prio and the max prio, we need to fold over the entire tree uh, to find that. Um, but it's also good so we can see that uh, PSQ also provides like a number of higher order functions such as folds and maps and these sort of things we, we, we expect from a container library in Haskell. Um, and then, so if the max value is reached, what we're going to do is we're going to update our pure cache, then we're going to trim it again to actually trim it. Um, and so we'll update the thick to sort of shift everything downward. Um, and then I also want to talk about this one unsafe trick here. Um, so hash PS, PSQ libraries in general provides a number of unsafe functions that allow you to do things a bit faster. Um, but these functions are not unsafe because they allow you to violate the invariance uh, of the library. And if you're, you're do that, well, you basically shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so unsafe map monotonic. Uh, allows you to map over all the elements and the priorities in the queues, um, but as a user, you need to promise that you're going to change the priorities uh, monotonally. So that means, like, if something, yeah, for example, subtracting something is uh, monotonic, uh, but if you would sort of negate the numbers, it would not be. And the advantage of doing this is that we know that the tree will have exactly the same shape before as after, um, so there's not no rebalancing. Uh, or things like that going on. Um, so that's why uh, the PSQ is like we provide a number of functions like this. And so Kraken here is fine because you don't also don't overflow, right? Mm -hmm. Once if you overflow, you're also in trouble, right? So you can't subtract anything before we um, right? So, oh, I'm not sure. Um, so I think if oh. you, oh, but so the, the uh, it's a tick that overflows, right? Not the maximum priority. Um, so all the all the priorities in the queue are less, like strictly less than tick. Um, so th this should still be fine. Yeah, well, we're saying the arbit arbitrary uh, subtraction would not be safe, right? No, here yes. it's, yeah, uh, it's exactly, safe yeah. because you know what you yeah, know you know the priority yeah, is fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we're similar to the priority. Yeah, okay. arbitrary uh, subtraction is not fine. Um, so next is the actual implementation of trim, which is not too hard. So we just uh, decrease the size by one, uh, and then we remove the minimum element uh, from the tree, which in this case is the oldest item because we probably don't care about the oldest item anymore. Uh, and if the size is still smaller than capacity, then we just return the initial uh, pure cache. Um, so that's trim. Um, once we have trim, then we can implement insert. Um, so because PSQ is sort of like a toolbox library, it provides less functions than I would say, for example, containers. But the function it does provide are a bit more general purpose. So rather than having insert, uh, which PSQ doesn't have, we will provide something like insert view, um, which gives you a view of what was inserted. Uh, and by that we mean, we so you give it a key, a priority, and a value to insert, you give it the hash priority queue, and then what you get back is not only the new queue, but also the old element that was already there for the given key. And yeah, so most functions return a little more information than what you typically want. Um, but in this case, we need this. Uh, 
um, because we're, if we insert something in our cache, uh, we're going to use insert view, and we're going to use the old element uh, to determine whether or not we need to update the size. Uh, because if something was already there for that queue, the size remains the same, otherwise the size increases. Um, and then we update the tick, uh, and we trigger in a new queue. Um, so now let's do lookup for this pure cache. Um, so lookup is also something that changes our pure cache because if you look something up, it was again sort of recently accessed. Um, so it's actually something that mutates our, our cache. Um, and if you remember the Dijkstra implementation at the complete beginning of this talk, uh, we're gonna use the same function here called alter, um, which allows you to pass in this this other function, which um, basically looks at what was there for this key, and it might change uh, the priority, it might change the value, and we can even return this B, and then this B will appear in the final return type as well. Um, so I think the way to think about this function is you provide your user, uh, your user function, and then we will sort of search in the tree for your element, we will apply the function that you gave us, and the function that you gave us can compute some, some B, because maybe you want to compute something based on the priority or whatever, um, and then we change it according to your function and we return the new value. Um, so, we're gonna use this to implement lookup, and we're actually gonna use this, this B that I was talking about. Um, and so, our lookup is basically just called it alter, uh, with our custom user function that we can pass in for this key and the queue. Um, and this custom user function is very simple. Um, so this, as you remember, this is the user function that sort of receives the node that was at that point in the tree. Um, and if, it, if there's nothing there, it's gonna return, it's gonna leave nothing there and we're gonna return nothing as well. Um, so if we find some node there, uh, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify this node because we're gonna put the new tick in place because it was recently used. Um, and then we're also gonna return the value that was there. And this is, allows us to use alter to sort of look up the, uh, an element and also bump the priority at the same time. Um, and then depending on the result of that, like if nothing was there, we return nothing. Uh, we throw away the new queue uh, but that's fine because Haskell is lazy. Um, and then we, if we found something there, we need to increase the tick so that we get the right tick the next time. And uh, we return the found value. Um, Out of curiosity, is it <coughs> useful to have two mages instead of one? Um, so the two mages, well, there's actually only, in the type of alter, there's only one mage. Right, okay. Um, because, okay, so this user function sort of receives whether or not there was a node there, and it can return oh, nothing. Yeah, yeah, okay. So like... Um, so B is maybe something, right? Yeah, so in this case, B is maybe something, and this, uh, in this case, we always map nothing to nothing and just to just, yeah. okay. because we don't want to remove or add things to the tree. Um, and so, okay, so I talked about alter, and it's a really cool function, but it's not super efficient, um, because if we look at alter, it really allows you to manipulate anything any way you want, right? So for example, you could take the priority and the value and then if they're both ints, uh, we could, for example, set the new priority to the priority multiplied by the value of or other weird things like that. And in that case, it's sort of imaginable that our node would be at the, the very bottom of the tree and we'd have to move it all the way up um, and things like that which is not the most efficient way to, to do things. Um, in our case, uh, when, for this cache, when we're doing this lookup, we're always gonna set the priority to PC tick, which is uh, like a sort of a constant. It doesn't really depend on the priority that was there before. Um, and we have this additional invariant that this PC tick is sort of bigger than anything that's in the cache. Um, so th this means that the node will never move up in the tree, so we'll only move further down the bottom. Um, and we can use this to use like another uh, fun unsafe uh, value, another uh, unsafe uh, function, 
uh, that sort of knows that it's only going to move the node further down the tree because the sort of the general purpose alter has to do a uh, search all the way down the tree to find it. Then maybe it has to move it down or it has to move it back up again. Um, so that's why we have this other uh, function, which is uh, unsafe lookup increase priority. Um, so the unsafe bet here is that the user promises that they're going to increase the priority. Um, and again, like uh, hash PS, PSQ's library provides uh, a large number of these, um, but only where they're very common. And sort of looking something up and increasing the uh, priority is something that's super common if you're implementing caches. Um, so this is what it looks like uh, with unsafe lookup increased priority rather than alter. Um, and as you can see, the code is actually a bit simpler because we don't need to pass this higher order function. We just uh, set the priority to be specific. Um, and yeah, there's also an unsafe insert increased priority view uh, that we could have used to make insert faster. And there, there's lots of fun uh, opportunities for people who like to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, but it's often important because um, if you're at this stage of implementing your own caches, uh, it's very likely that you're worried about performance. Um, so that's why we, we want to give you these tools. Um, okay, so this is sort of the summary of what we have so far for a simple pure cache uh, that does LRU eviction. Uh, so you have an empty cache, you can insert something and you can look something up. Uh, and the important bit is, I guess, that the lookup also returns you a new cache because we can, might change priorities. Um, so if you're only writing pure code, like for example, the Dijkstra implementation, you're good. Um, but often you want to do use uh, I.O. Um, and we're going to start by simply doing this by putting our pure cache inside an I.O. Uh, so we get a mutable reference uh, to this. Um, and in Haskell, there's a few sort of um, reference uh, types that you can use, and they all have sort of different, uh, different properties. Um, and this is sort of how I think about them frequently, uh, where IORF is um, fast, but it's also a bit unsafe if you're doing concurrent programming because you don't really get any guarantees. Um, you can't, for example, t lock them or do things like that. Then there's MVARs, which are a bit safer, but you can still create deadlocks uh, and so on. And sort of at the far end, there's TVAR, which uses uh, software to injectional memory. Um, so that's very safe and composes nicely, but you also pay for it with a bit more overhead. Uh, I just need to really quick, uh, RF has atomic operation time, just don't know right. how fast they are compared to them. Or right. Yeah, they do, but uh, so the thing is, um, you have an atomic, we're actually going to talk about it in a bit. Um, the, the thing is, you can't create a lock on it, so you can't combine doing something atomic right. by it, but also doing some IO. Um, so, and actually, in most cases, I, I would just use TVAR by default because it's much nicer to program with and it's usually fast enough anyway. Um, but in our case, we're going to use uh, IO refs for now. Um, so creating a new cache is very easy. We just create a new IORF that is with an empty pure cache inside. Um, and the way we're not going to implement uh, an insert and a lookup, we're going to use like a like sort of a higher order combinator called simple cache um, that you you give it the cache and some key to cache on, and then what you give it is some IO of A, which is the value, um, and then the the cache will either execute this IO block or it won't execute it uh, if it's already in the cache. Um, because writing sort of code like this is much nicer than doing the lookup and the insert manually. Um, so this is what the type looks like. Uh, I think it's reasonably easy to understand. So you give it the cache, then you give it the key, and then you give it some IO action to execute, and it will, it will return uh, a V, maybe that is the result of the IO action, or maybe it was the thing that was already in the cache. Um, as a user, you don't really care at this, at this point. Um, so we can implement this like this. Um, so we're going to take the cache, we're first going to do a lookup inside there to see if, there's, if it's there. 
uh, return it if it was there. Uh, yeah, we just return it. Otherwise, we actually have to execute the I.O. and then we insert it in our pure cache. So this lookup and insert are the functions we defined before for the pure cache. Uh, and then we return the value. So mm. I think there are two things wrong with this code, which were not, well, subjectively wrong, <laughs> I guess, uh, which we're not going to talk too much. But like, does anyone know what's wrong with this code? Um, so the first problem is that you can have some concurrency issues uh, because we can only do this locking and then execute the pure function. Uh, so it's possible that two threads do this part and then end up executing the IO action. Um, the second problem is like if this IO action returns an exception, uh, then it won't be inserted into the cache. So oh, actually in terms of exceptions, it's fine, but then you're still doing a little bit too much. Um, and yeah, so these sort of design questions are again, sometimes highly application specific. Um, so that's why it's nice that we have a library like PSQs rather than just providing all of this for you because it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, in all of applications, it's not really a bad thing if a call happens twice. Uh, it would be, uh, you, so while well, it's a trade-off you make, right? You would rather make some calls twice uh, rather than introducing like more overhead for locking and so on. Um, or maybe in another application you care more about like everything is executed exactly once. Um, so that's really for the, for the user to decide. Um, so what is the problem with this? We'll go a little bit further to uh, implement our final cache. Um, so the problem with this is that atomic modify IRAP is in some cases it's really fast, but in other cases it's really slow. Uh, and I'll explain how this works. So the, the way atomic modify IRAP is implemented, it is thus a compare and swap. Um, so what the, the, does that mean? So we provided this function to modify what's in the IOF. Um, and for example, if we have one IOF that's being incremented from all, all kinds of different threads, uh, and we're using atomic modify IOF to make sure that we don't read, for example, a tree, we incremented and put the four there, but by the time uh, we put the four there, someone else has already, already changed it, so we want to avoid that. Uh, and so the way that works is we will uh, execute the function uh, and then first check if the old value was still there and then only then we will uh, put well, that. What does it actually compare? Um, okay. So pointers <coughs> or what? Uh, pointers of things, yeah. 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 Um, and so one, one way to, to uh, give an example of this, so you can sort of compare this to, for example, uh, the DMV or something or some bureaucratic thing, except I guess it's actually okay in Switzerland, but other countries then. Um, so imagine sort of queuing somewhere and you take a numbered form, um, but really all the people arriving there take the same form with the same number, uh, and everyone they starts filling it in. Uh, then when they call a number, the first one who's able to hand in the form, uh, they get it accepted. But really, everyone, everyone else has to fill in a new form for the next number. Um, so I think that's something you uh, you can compare to, it, and it's this is called a contention problem. Um, and so this looks like a really stupid design for sort of I/O primitives, um, but it turns out if you have only have a few people accessing the system at the same time, it's actually really fast because there's so little overhead. Um, and then as you get more and more threads accessing this, it scales dramatically bad. Um, so, and also because cats is usually implemented in hardware. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we can't really make filling in the form uh, faster, uh, but we can sort of decrease the, the amount of people queuing uh, in a really simple way. Um, so for our final cache of the evening, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna open a number of boots for our uh, administrative center. Um, so rather than having just one simple cache, we're gonna use uh, a vector, so we can have a number of them. Um, and when you create one, you're gonna give it the number you wanna create, and then, of course, still a maximum uh, capacity. So for example, 
uh, you could create 16 uh, caches or something like that. So the new is very, very simple. We just call replicate M uh, to execute creating this new cache a number of times. And then you get back a vector. Um, and we have the same uh, function signature where you give it this IO block and it might or might not execute it depending on whether it's in the cache. Um, and because we already have this sort of constraint that our keys are hashable, um, we, we just hash the key and pick, and pick a booth depending on the hash. Um, and this works because you're always going to have the, you're always going to want to look in the same booth for the same key. Um, so yeah, it's kind of nice that we can implement this faster concurrent cache in just one slide in Haskell. Uh, and yeah, it's very simple because we, we started out by building this complicated data structure and then we just so, sort of built simple layers and simple layers on top of them. Um, and we end up with something that's actually very usable. Um, so conclusion, we have a nice six pack of data structures. We have our ORT PSQ with the tournament trees. We have our in PSQ. We talked about creating a hash PSQ. Uh, then on the cache side, we looked at the pure cache, the simple cache, and finally uh, one where we stripe uh, the access to the caches. Um, so that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned something. Any questions? We're still working on the library. Um, it's in maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm, in the last three years, well, it's, I like to keep it back, things backward compatible, so that's one uh, mm -hmm. one reason for not changing things. I think the only change we changed was adding more unsafe functions. Um, so, like for example, someone opened an issue about the unsafe map monotonic, saying, uh, like I want to change something, but it's a bit slow if we change everything in three. Um, so those kind of like small maintenance issues, yeah. How to deal in general with the same priorities? Several things in the queue with the same um, priorities? So if things in the same, if the things have the same priority, you compare the keys. Mm -hmm. um, because you need to, you know that the keys are unique and you have some deterministic system for, for determining. And if you have like the top priority and a new one, new element comes with the same priority as the top one, yeah. is it like replaced or? <laughs> um, so you you use the key as like a second thing to compare. So if they have the same priority but uh, a lower key, for example, then it will go into the top. But as a higher key, mm -hmm. then it will go. Uh, I mean the, of course the. Comparing the keys is sort of arbitrary if you're talking about the hash PSQ because you're really just comparing the hash. Um, but the important part is that it's pure and deterministic. Do you provide an alternatives to uh, maintain, say, to enforce the size of the cache or to remove some things automatically? Or is it uh, no. So the, the I mean, all the caches I talked about are like outside of the library. Uh, and then, yeah, I think the idea is it's a toolbox library, you can build your own, your own thing. I know that when, at a, because like at a pre previous startup I was working at, at, at Better, um, we actually had, a, rather than doing the capacity uh, for these caches, uh, we had another library which estimated like the byte size for something in there. Um, so you can do like, more accurate things, for example, if you want to have like a one gigabyte cache or something like that. Okay, thank you. Thanks.